What's up everyone, Alex here. Happy 20,000 subscribers, everyone. I've been at this for five years and I never thought that I'd reach this goal. So for everybody who's actually watched, commented, liked, even disliked any of my videos, I just wanna say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I've always wanted Backlog Battle to be a place where everybody could rediscover their love for games. Because sometimes there's a lot of negativity out there when it comes to the gaming press, whether it's negativity directed towards certain people or negativity towards like something is happening in the industry. And with Backlog Battle, I just wanted to get back to the bare basics. Like what are the things that we really enjoy and cherish in games? And above all else, there's also an aspect of it where I wanted to learn how to like certain things that I didn't like before to better understand the people who do. It's like some sort of like empathic kind of exercise, but I think I've become a better reviewer because of it. And I have to thank all of you for that. Before we get to the Q&A though, I just wanna thank Atlas for this really awesome Shujin Academy jacket. I don't know why I'm doing this. Uh, they sent it over to me as part of the gift that they sent over to me a week or two ago, and it's finally arrived. And you know, it's a little bit long, <laughs> but it's okay. It fits really snugly. It fits really nice. This came from Insert Coin, and I just want to say thank you to both Atlas and Insert Coin for sending this over. This is really cool, and I highly recommend this. This is pretty awesome. But you're here for the Q&A, so why don't we just get started with that? So we're gonna just start from like the oldest to the most recent, and I hope I get to answer all of your questions to your satisfaction. So Mateus Golub asks, tell us what was your first JRPG and your experience with it? My first JRPG is actually, there's two of them. Final Fantasy being the first one, and the very first one for the NES slash Famicom. And the other one isn't really a JRPG. It's more like a port of a Western RPG, but done in a JRPG style, which is Ultima Quest of the Avatar. Now, if you've watched my tactics RPG video, I do show gameplay from it and pretty much the many reasons why I like it. But Final Fantasy was really the one, the, a pure JRPG, if you will, that really kind of got me into the storytelling I just almost knocked that off. That got me into the storytelling, the gameplay, the job system is really great. And I don't know, like there's something magical about that because it even had like this fold out map that I could look at. And I had, a, I think I borrowed a friend's strategy guide for it. And I just remember being so enamored by it and being terrified of encountering Warmech in the final dungeon because uh, no, it wasn't in the final dungeon, it was Tiamat's dungeon, and being really terrified of meeting him because it was so powerful. And of course, that's when I started asking the question of like, why is the most powerful enemy in the game not the blast boss? <laughs> but you know, it is what it is, there were kids back then. So, but yeah, those are the two that I actually started with. Silent Victory asks, do you have any comfort games that you replay all over again? Um, I used to replay a lot of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, maybe before it got ported to a million different platforms. <laughs> like at this point, like because it was on different platforms, I was just like, oh, I don't know if I can keep playing this game because now I don't know which version to play because that's the problem of owning one game on multiple platforms. Now you got to deliberate on like, okay, which platform can I play the game on or will want to play the game on. I still have my PS1 version of it. The I think I want to say like it's probably the greatest hits version, so it's not like the the purple, you know, CD cover and stuff, but you know, I it still has a special place in my heart and I really do love that game and maybe I'll you know, I'll do something else. Like maybe I'll I'll play something else, but the first game that comes to mind really is Castlevania Symphony in the Night. Like, I really do love that game. And I love Alucard as a protagonist. Alex Turieu, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, asks, what are some of your favorite non-binary coded characters in JRPGs or just your favorite? I'm guessing you're talking about like non-binary characters in JRPGs and they aren't really specifically non-binary, but it did create conversations about it, and that would be Naoto from Persona 4. I've always loved Naoto. I've loved Naoto and Kanji-kun. Both of them really kind of made me question a lot about like my gender and 
and the definitions of gender and those boundaries and you know why certain hobbies or actions are just defined by gender and only are slotted to a specific gender particularly because like even when i was a kid like i used to play a lot with dolls and stuff like my cousin and stuff like we'd always play with dolls and all, all that but there was never really any question of like masculinity or anything like that it was just like right there right like it's just you know, it's it's either like a G.I. Joe or a Transformer or like dolls, Barbie or whatever. And I was just like, OK, whatever. But the bottom line was like, I really do love Naoto and the progression of their character and how in a way it's somewhat open ended, even though that there's sequels built upon that game. I think that it's really nice to kind of just leave it to the person that's playing it to kind of interpret those um, personal introspections that both Naoto and Kanji has. And yes, the, the developers could define something a bit clearer to fit them more better in a box, but really like, you know, I think where games are truly magical is when you experience a story and you try to figure out like, how does that apply to my life and where I am right now? Because I do notice that a lot of JRPG fans out there do play games and then they just kind of consume, consume, consume. Gosh, I'm hitting this again. Consume, consume, consume. And they don't really think about like the morality of things. And by the way, I'm not saying that everybody does this. I, I do know that some of you guys out there think about this, but I think it's very important to kind of think about like the story we just played too and how it relates to us, whether it's fantastical or sci-fi, because typically it's rooted in some sort of humanity. Anyways, I'm preaching. Let's move on. This is another question by Mateus Golab. Is there any other passion or hobby that you're super into besides video games? And Teddy had a follow-up question to it. So let me answer Mateus first. My number one passion is video games. And there are other medium, let's say, that I truly love in addition to that. I like going to theme parks. Unfortunately, where I live, there's not a lot of theme parks. But when I do go to California, let's say, like I do go to a lot of those theme parks and experience storytelling. Because I do believe that the first medium for interactive storytelling isn't actually video games, it's theme parks. Because everybody in theme parks is asked to play a role and we kind of just have to react to it based off of like what's happening to us, right? Um, and you know, there's like this kind of illusion that happens. They, like Disney calls it the Disney magic and stuff. Oh God, what's happening in my eyeballs? Like I can't see all of a sudden. I think like because the AC went on. But anyways, and it's a physical location, right? It's virtual because really, you know that when you go backstage, backstage, like it's all maintenance stuff. It's, it's everything the park needs to kind of keep it looking the way that it is or maintaining the way that it is. And so that's why I think that, you know, theme parks are diverse very first virtual worlds and the people who are trying to build meta worlds and stuff really have a lot to learn from theme parks and other games like MMOs, for example. So I do want to kind of address Teddy Cheddar's comment as well. So they say sort of in the same vein, so I'm replying here, but also curious about what other media you're into in general and how that might affect which games you enjoy and how you feel about games in general. So um, a few years ago, I was trying to find like inspiration for a lot of the stuff that I'm doing for Backlog Battle and I tweeted to Corey Barlog who was the director of God of War 2 and the director of God of War 2018 and I asked him like do you find inspiration for your work outside of video games and of course he confirmed yes to my you know I had a suspicion the answer was yes but he confirmed it because the reality of it is like for example if you want to be a YouTuber like it's cool that there's a lot of other YouTubers, for example, that might inspire you, but typically you get inspiration, like really good inspiration outside of that. So whether it's music, movies, TV shows, or any other creative medium, even like home construction or industrial design, like furniture and all that stuff. So really for me, like the biggest passion that I have is design, is storytelling, those sorts of things. And the kind of media that I'm interested in are movies, of course. There's a lot of documentaries that I really like. In fact, I do listen to a lot of, um, what's the right word for it? Uh, memoirs like on audiobooks so I do also get inspiration from audiobooks the way that I actually present myself narrative wise comes from a lot of inspiration from audiobooks TV 
uh, definitely. Like even reality game shows like RuPaul's Drag Race, for example, I find a lot of inspiration from that, not just from like what the queen, the drag queens are doing, but also from like the kind of answers and how they deal with challenges. Because if you really think about like reality show challenges, it's literally like, you know, one challenge is one week, right? And you know, they don't have a lot of time and they don't have a lot of resources. And as, as a YouTuber, like we, I don't have a lot of those. Like, you know, the only kind of cost that I have is like, you know, pretty much like um, time and whatever I have on here. And pretty much like, you know, I have to keep a lot of these things in check to deliver some really awesome videos that you guys love. But this is kind of like a long-winded answer. What I feel about video games is what I feel about video games and what you see in the video. I don't really have like any sort of like, oh, I wish video games did something that movies did, or I wish that video games did something that TV did because video games are their own thing. So trying to make it another medium or similar to something else is kind of antithetical to what video games are, which is its own kind of medium. Um, but yeah, like, I, I think those are like really good questions so far. Like, keep it up guys. Like it's, I'm really liking, it's, it's also, it's like, oh, <laughs> it's also interesting because it's like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to practice being more spontaneous with you guys. And I don't actually know if I'm going to edit this too much from like what the original is, but I'm hitting it again. I'm hitting it again. <laughs> I don't know why, Let, let's just keep moving. MRP1234 asks, what is your favorite non-JRPG? Oh, this is hard. This is hard. There's actually a lot. Um, I really do like God of War, uh, God of War 2018. I like God of War 2 specifically. I like Cory Barlog's work on the series. I love David Jaffe. I think he's a brilliant game designer in general, but I love God of War 2 and God of War 2018 because I think Corey has a very clear vision of what he wants to accomplish, especially now that he's an adult and a parent. And, you know, he is able, to, he's one of those creators that's able to kind of take his personal experience and apply it into the creative work that he has. I, that's the kind of content creator that I want to be is to be able to kind of relate to people based off of my personal experience. I think Corey does it pretty well. Like everybody, even though there weren't parents and stuff, were able to relate to Kratos and Atreus's plight because of the way that that game is designed. So, and before people ask, I don't have the money to get God of War Ragnarok. I didn't even pre-order the game. Um, I am missing out on that big time, but then, then again, there's a lot of JRPGs coming out. So, you know, give or take, right? So that's, that's pretty much where I'm at in terms of, you know, like God of War Ragnarok, if anybody's asking. Awesome Goku wanted to ask something, but I'm going to read their comment anyway, which is, ah, damn, I have the same question as Matt, but oh well. But yeah, is there a story behind you getting into JRPGs? You might have answered me on TikTok and I missed it, so that's why I'm asking here. My apologies. So I just kind of got into it, right? Like the thing is, like in the 80s, um, you know, I just you know basically played a lot of games that were given to me or like sent to me um you know like i remember getting final fantasy and being really excited for it and you know not knowing how to play it because it was a new genre um i think that's also one of the main reasons why i'm so big into helping other people get into genres because it wasn't only that but i also remember when i was like in high school in english class i remember this very specifically there's a guy like a big guy like just kind of like sitting right behind me who saw me kind of flip through like the final fantasy eight like strategy guide or something like that and he basically said his guy's guy's name is brian i still remember him he said like dude is that like a strategy guide for final fantasy eight and i said yeah man like do you play this he's like yeah dude like i'm stuck in that one part and i don't remember what it is but he described it and i was like yeah dude if you want to borrow it cool i just hit it again um, and then the person in front of me, like, noticed the conversation. He turned around and said, can I borrow it after Brian? And I said, yeah, sure. And the funniest thing about this conversation, and mind you, this was like around 1998 or something like that, right? The guy behind me, Brian, was the high school quarterback. Think about that for a second and think about what I just said. It's literally the high school quarterback, really buff dude, white dude. Like, I remember him, you know, like, just really tanky and stuff. 
he literally asked me for my Final Fantasy VIII strategy guide, which by the way, in case people are curious, he did get it back to me and the person in front of me did borrow it right afterwards. I didn't need it. I think I remember finishing it at the time, but uh, it was just a really cool kind of interaction between me and somebody else. And that's what told me like, you know, all these people around us and stuff like who play Call of Duty and stuff, the reason why they probably don't know about the magic of JRPGs is because, well, they haven't tried or found one that they connected with. But literally, I'll always remember Brian because he basically said like, you know, Final Fantasy VIII is like one of his favorite RPGs and stuff. And yeah, that's like the high watermark when it comes to um, understanding other people, I feel. And that's kind of like where I've been coming from to this day. Let's ask the next question because I, I don't want to kind of go into tangents. It's probably going to be a long video, right? Xaver G asks, Hey Alex, just wondering, what's your most anticipated game release for the next year? Ooh, that's hard. I'm looking forward to Rain Code. Um, I'm a fan of Danganronpa, and you should be too if you haven't tried it yet. I know that some people have taken umbrage to like the whole high school killings and stuff, but Rain Code kind of takes a lot of those games. You know what? Watch the video. I don't. I hit it again. I hit it again. <laughs> and uh, and I have a video on Rain Code. You should you should check it out. But also One Piece Odyssey. I became a fan of One Piece, you know, over the past year or so and caught up with episode 1000 something rather. I don't remember. Maybe it's a thousand like 57 or what have you. But i um, really been enjoying that anime. Very wholesome in many respects, but also quite the long term storytelling. It's fact, I remember Oda, the creator, saying like, oh, we're nearing the the start of the last arc of One Piece, which I thought to myself, what is it? It's gonna be like another 10 years or something like that. I'll be in my 50s when it's done or something, but that seems to be what's happening. So um, One Piece Odyssey is definitely one of my most anticipated games next year. And also, of course, how could I forget Final Fantasy 16 because I'm a big Final Fantasy 14 fan. I love Yoshi P, he can do no wrong. I have a really good feeling about Final Fantasy 16. And I do have a video that I'm planning to make about Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy in general. If you're interested, I want to see and hear from the Final Fantasy fans in the comments below because it seems like there's not a lot of you out there. So let me know that you're interested and I'll get to work on it. All right, what's next? Mateus Golab, once again, asked why the stylish hat? Can you believe that I hated hats for a long time? So like about 10, 12 years ago, like I really hated hats, maybe even before that, but it became part of my repertoire. Like, you know, I love hats like these, like page boy hats, newsboy hats. So I kind of like said to myself, you know what? Let's make hats a thing. Uh, I remember um, Ayumi Hamasaki having like a really gigantic hat and I wanted that. I couldn't find it anywhere. Went on Amazon, went everywhere. I couldn't find it. But I've always loved hats since then because, you know, they're just cool. It can hold your hair and do all sorts of cool stuff, right? And it makes for a good character when it's drawn. So why not? 100 servings are asking me some really crazy questions about, should I change to full synthetic for your 2016 Nissan Rogue? I'm gonna give you a really bad advice and say And I'm not gonna answer any more questions because this is a gaming channel in case you're wondering. So ask gaming questions, okay? Teddy actually has a question. They said, I've been curious what goes into selecting which character represents a game on the banner. Ha, is it your favorite character from the game or one that you best feel represents the game itself? Or is it just visually appealing maybe? Or perhaps I'm overthinking it, but it seems like the right time to ask. I did respond to this, but I wanted to let everybody know that yes, the banner does mean something. In fact, if you are brand new to the channel, um, if you've not subscribed, I almost hit it again. Um, there is a video that basically talks about what the banner means. Um, I highly recommend checking that out. I'm gonna also link it in the description of this video and putting it in the cards up there on the top right corner so that you can check it out. It's just a very short video, but the bottom line is it's a ranking system. It is a ranking system unlike anything you've ever seen before because it takes into account how YouTube displays the banner, but also hype in general. So if you're curious, check out that video and um, be in the know.
right? <laughs> The Enrat asks, what are your top 10 favorite characters in video gaming you've experienced so far? That is really difficult. Um, that's something that I would have to consider a lot, but you know what? Let's just do it, you know, by random. These are not ranked because that's just gonna be, you know, take, making this video take too long. So um, I like Alucard, I like Solid Snake and Naked Snake, so all the snakes in, you know, Metal Gear, the Metal Gear series. Um, I personally like Ryu Hayabusa in the NES. I hit it again. I hit it again. It always happens. The NES Ninja Guidance, not the newer ones, although I do like the newer ones as well. So that's three. Okay, that's three. Um, shoot. That becomes tough. I like Ishtola from Final Fantasy XIV. She's a great character. And as Master Matoya, it's really a cool callback to Final Fantasy One, which I talked about earlier. Um, let me think, let me think, let me think. The Belmonts, I suppose, like, I mean, but probably not as high up there as Alucard. You know, the Belmonts started my Castlevania journey, so I just have to honor them, I feel. Um, Igor from the Persona series, in a way, because like, He's always been there since like, you know, Persona 3 and stuff. And I would like him to kind of continue on that role, even though of course the voice actor in Japanese kind of passed away. But you know, Igor is like one of my favorites just because he's like this kind of sniveling, like, welcome. <laughs> maybe maybe there's something to like Transylvanian or like that kind of accent that I that I like. I don't know. Um, Strider Hero. I just love the games. And of course, I love Strider 2. That's like one of my favorite kind of Metroidvanias of recent memory. Um, I've all, and the design as a ninja, it's like really badass, right? Um, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Would it be crazy to say that... Um, Eeyore, um, not Eeyore. I'm, I'm remember, I'm misremembering her name, but, um, the character from 13 Sentinels that has blonde hair and stuff, and that might not be great, but she's a great representation of 13 Sentinels for me. So I really like that character. Um, man, this is really difficult guys. Why did you ask 10? You could have asked five of all things, right? Um, Mega Man. Mega Man has always been kind of like a character that I've grown up with and stuff. I remember making DND &D templates based off of the different Grandmaster characters and whatnot. And the last one, the last one, um, I feel like I've already answered this before, but like Naoto and Kanji and maybe, and this is kind of cheating, but the ensemble cast of Persona 4, I love those guys. It's you know, it's a game that's all about finding your own identity. And I feel like a lot of JRPG players kind of struggle with that, you know, like based off of like my conversations with you guys and everybody else. And so I find that really fascinating as, you know, as just an ensemble and as, as a game in general. And I can't wait to replay it once it gets re-released on modern platforms next year as Golden. So yeah, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Uh, Red Lunatic asks, who's the character in the GIF uh, in the post? You know, it's such a mood. Honestly, I just Googled, what is it? Um, anime Q&A or something like that. And that's pop that's what popped up. I have no idea where she's from. So let me know if anybody knows in the comments who or where that person came from. And I much appreciate it. So Teddy Cheddar has another question because I answered the other question that he had earlier, which is what goes into making a review? Do you take notes as you play or wait until you finish to let your thoughts coalesce? How much time besides the actual play do you spend in general making one? Always interested in the behind the scenes of creating videos like you do. Thank you very much. Teddy, if you want a lot of behind the scenes stuff, I will direct you to my Patreon at patreon.com slash backlog battle because I talk a lot about the behind the scenes stuff, not just in the Patreon itself, but also on our Patreon Discord. I am there every single day and answering people's questions and also showing you what I'm working on next and talking about all this other stuff. But to kind of, I, ha I have a reluctance in answering this question, not because I don't want you guys to know, but because not everybody likes the answer to these questions. So I'm gonna try to make it as short as possible, okay? What goes into making a review? I do take notes while I'm playing. I also take notes when certain things that I feel changed and my, changed my opinion of it, I write it down. 
And generally speaking, I do finish games, but you'd be surprised how little that has anything to do with 90% of the review, because guess what? I can't tell you the ending of the game and how it connects to the rest of the story without really spoiling it for you. So in, in essence, what I'm trying to do with my review is to capture 99.9% .9 of my experience of it. And that point one is basically the ending so that I don't ruin everything. And typically speaking, I do write notes every single time like I play through games and, you know, and I start actually crafting the narrative even before I finish the game. But I do finish the game before the review comes out just to kind of confirm a lot of the things that I said. And typically so far, I've had a 100% success rate in that, you know, every single game that I've reviewed pretty much turned out the way that it was in the beginning towards the end. So that's actually a really good record for me. Um, as far as actual time making the review, um, when I started, it used to be about five days to seven days. And I thought that that took way too long. And I'm always the kind of person that tries to improve every single time, trying to make things faster. Because I am what I was one of those people who used to think like, oh, in order to make it really quality, you have to spend a lot of time on it. But the reverse is also true, right? Like, you know, there are a lot of really good YouTubers out there who can spend the least amount of effort or least amount of time. I shouldn't say effort because it takes a, an equal amount of effort to make a shorter video or 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 take less time making a video, but have very thoughtful things to say about what they're talking about. And that's the goal right now. It's kind of flipped it on its head. And I said, I want to be faster at this, which means I need to be a better writer. I need to be a better outliner. I need to be a better everything. And this is always something that I consider in every single video. That sounds like hyperbole, but if you know me as a person, you know that I obsess over every single detail, even if things, you know, get produced fast. I'm always like looking at every single piece and making sure that you guys are also entertained in the process. But I think I'm gonna stop right there because again, I don't wanna bore the rest of you and talking about like the review process, but let, but you know, the bottom line is that I spend a lot of time thinking about what to make for everybody. And, you know, also ask myself, like, you know, what would be relevant and important to everybody who's watching this video? And sometimes I'll even like go to Reddit and check people out and stuff and what people are talking about as well. This next one is by Annika and they write, all right, more gaming related questions. What is your favorite type of side quest or side activity in video games? Oh boy, that is gonna be tough. Um, my favorite side quests in games so far have been th the th stories in The Witcher 3. And I felt even at the time that they were gonna revolutionize side quest design because it became just as important as the main story in The Witcher 3. And I thought that that was genius. I think a lot of games still have a lot to learn from that model, but I do understand that, you know, each game is designed differently. So sometimes that model might be too much, right? I think the other kind of uh, evolution of that side quest design happened with Xenoblade Chronicles 3 by having three different types of side quests. You have the hero quest for your jobs, you have your typical side quests, and you literally have Collectopedia for all your fetch quests, which is pretty nice. Not to say that it's only there, of course there are side quests that have uh, fetch quests as well, but a majority of them are in the Collectopedia, which I really, really like. Um, Let's see. But specific side quests, though, that's tough for me because I do play a lot of games over the past few years. I think one of my favorite kinds of side activities, I'll still hark back to something like Persona 4 Golden when you're like, I think you're like building like a model um, Gundam or like robot or something like that. And you have to kind of go back and you, you basically like kind of get your stats up by kind of persevering in that sort of activity. I really like that one. Um, but I think in general, like, you know, I liked the Witcher 3 style. I like the Xenoblade 3 style. I also like social links in general. I think even though like I've said in previous videos that, um, you know, some games can have it, some games don't, you don't necessarily need to have it. I do like that because it, it rewards you for being involved in character development. Cause I think that's just brilliant to, for, you know, to encourage people to kind of get into that and have like a gameplay benefit outside of that as well. 
So the next follow-up video, sorry, the next follow-up question by Annika is, also, this is maybe more of a personal question. Do you have a favorite dish, like something you don't need an appetite for, or something that just always hits the spot? Or if it's related to video games, has there ever been a dish in a game that you would need to, that you would like to try in real life? I am always down for two Japanese dishes, karage and katsu. Bar none. You have karage, you have katsu, I'm right there. I will have that. I, in fact, karage is probably like, you know, a recipe that I want to learn how to make. I have made katsu in the past, but never to the point where I captured how really crispy but not oily they are like when i went to japan more than two decades ago like i've always tried to master it that way and figure out like how that works um i've never eaten like at a japanese place lately that was able to capture that um you know sometimes the, the pieces are kind of rep like not represent but like rep are reminiscent more of like the hawaii style of like cutlet which i'm not you know that's cool too but it's not the japanese style right and so so yeah like that's pretty easy it's like just like you know those two and stuff and maybe fried chicken i just love fried chicken oh and jollibee i'm filipino so i love jollibee so like the chicken joy is fantastic i don't know how to make them but that was tasty when i was young and i love the, the gravy too and i miss that that's one of the things i miss in california is jollibee so there's that and Teddy had another question. Maybe this is the last question, but I'm going to refresh the browser window just to make sure that, you know, there hasn't been anything that kind of snuck up after that. Are there any ways that this channel has affected how you play games in general? Is it difficult to turn off quote unquote review mode when you're playing something just for fun or that you don't plan on making a video on? I realize this question preposes that you have time to play games just for fun, lol. Um, so here's the thing. I don't review games that I am not interested in. I think doing that makes you feel burnt out because you're forcing yourself to play something that you really have no interest in. Um, and that's why like I get a bunch of different like indie keys and stuff and I have to like really sift through them to try to find like the diamonds in a rough and the things that and the games that I really want to show you guys, because it takes a tremendous amount of time to do something like that. Um, you can't imagine how many emails I get like every single day from people asking me to cover their games. There's like so much and it's like 90%, you know, a lot of indie stuff. And, and while I admire the gumption and the hustle, it's really difficult to sort through. That being said, um, so this is going to be interesting because I don't think people think of this the same way. So even though YouTube is my full-time job, I do not consider playing the games as part of the job. That sounds silly, right? Because it's like, why? You make reviews and videos out of these games. Like, why don't you consider that as part of the work? Well, be because of the simple reason that if I look at games as work, it kind of diminishes their importance as a hobby to me and the reason and, and there's a very good reason why i think this way for one um back around early 2000s mid 2000s i actually used to work uh, as a qa person at activision that's you know i'm not gonna talk about that like there is a video out there that talks about it that i'll probably link in a card and the description of this video it's an interview conducted by my friend daniel santos about my experience with qa but the bottom line is like I worked a lot of overtime for that job and basically what happened was when I got home I was so friggin tired from work that I didn't even want to play a single video game because I literally was playing like a video game that you know for like 12 hours or something like that about 60 70 hours a week or whatever long it was I didn't mind the work personally but you know I noticed that it kind of took over and made you know playing games itself you know in a sort of negative um even though and mind you like you're probably thinking like oh it's probably because you're playing call of duty or, or something that you, you don't like right but that's not the case like i am proud of every single game that i actually qa'd and you know like spider-man ultimate spider-man is a great example of that spider-man for the ps1 for example call of duty 3 even though it wasn't popular i really am proud of the work that we did in that game so it's not even that it's just that when you associate something like a hobby with work that's when things start messing around with your brain thinking like oh well it's work therefore huh you need to relax and do something else outside of that 
So when I became a YouTuber, I thought to myself, I am not going to succumb to embargoes. If I feel like I need to play the game more, I am not going to release my review on embargo and I'm going to wait until the release date of the game to get my opinion out and not have to rush to the end of the game. So, you know, sometimes that happens. In fact, it happened twice that I remember, which is Atelier Ryza, because I actually, the first one, because I actually got sick when I was reviewing that game. And so I actually like apologized to everybody, but then it turned out to be one of my most popular videos. And the second one is Persona 5 Royal. Like the embargo was out and everybody's releasing their reviews on it. But I literally had the game for like maybe four or five days or something. And I'm like, I'm not going to rush to the end to like release my review. I'm going to wait for like another week or two when the game is out and I'm going to release my video then. It's not popular. It's not going to get like so many clicks or something like that. But I'm not doing it for the money. The money just happens to be the result of all the hard work. The hard work is the one that's supposed to bring you guys in and make you love what I'm doing. It's not the other way around. And I've always believed in that even to this day, that if I do my best work, the money then comes after that. And I feel like it's been the case, especially I hit it again <laughs> over the past month or so. I've really worked hard to kind of really improve the way that I make videos. And that's that because again, I don't want to bore you all with details. Okay, it's actually a good thing that I refreshed it because literally I think I've been talking to this thing for like about half an hour now and literally within the past half hour, there's like two new questions. So I'm going to answer them as well. S. Caracas asks, what got you into gaming? For me, it was Famicom Super Mario. Ooh, that's actually a very good question. So I grew up with video games even when I was a baby. Um, my family was really big into it. Uh, my grandma actually had started an arcade and she strategically, in quotes, positioned it right next to a university until the local government shut down her business because she was, quote unquote, preying on the money of all the college students. <laughs> so basically like all those arcade cabinets, those are like the cocktail table cabinets where the screen is actually a table and then you, you know, the, uh, player one and player two are sitting uh, across from each other and the, the image would flip. Um, so we took a couple home and, you know, I played with them when I was a kid. Uh, my uncle had an Atari, but the time that I really got into get to video games is actually thanks to my dad. My dad, I hadn't seen for, I want to say a very long time. We're talking like maybe 10 years and stuff. And I'm not going to get into that because it's a little bit personal. But when we saw each other, she, he introduced me to the Famicom. And there were two games that I played on that. One is Xerion, which is like a shmup by Jalico that just keeps repeating over and over. I don't even think it has an ending. But the real game that got me into video games, I think, was Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. And the reason why is because of you know, the action, it was really cool. Um, the character expressions, that game showed me that video games can have different facial expressions and stuff, um, and how fast games could be and how satisfying it is to like knock somebody out. And, and, you know, like not surprisingly, it's also a game that I identified with because I was a boxing fan uh, when I was a kid as well. Like I like, you know, I loved Mike Tyson during that era and stuff. And, you know, every time like he'd come on, you know, pay-per-view and stuff, we'd always watch him. Um, so it's always a big deal. But this was a really cool game because like, you know, it showed me a lot of the potential of video games, even with that one game. And unfortunately, I didn't come home with that. I came home with Xerion. But then my parents, my, my mom specifically, heard about it and she's very competitive. So she bought me an NES. So now I had a Famicom and an NES. So, and the rest is pretty much history. You know, that's how I got Final Fantasy. It's in English and all these other like really cool games. So that's how I started. I know that's kind of like a long, you know, diatribe of like, you know, details, but you know, that's what we're here for, right? The final comment, and again, I'm going to refresh this before we stop, is by Mr. Dimry, who asks, what's the video that you're most proud of? Thanks for the effort and stay awesome. Okay, that's a tough question, because to me, I am proud of every video that I come out with, whether regardless of whether it's perfect or not. And 
again, it's I think the reason for that is because I use every video as an opportunity to learn and improve for everybody, not just for you guys, but for myself, because being a creator is asking yourself to test yourself within the limits of your capabilities. Like I don't have infinite budget. You guys might think I'm making like thousands of dollars a month as a YouTuber. It's not. And I learn a lot about like what you guys want to watch, what I want to watch from just talking with everybody and being a part of this community. Because you probably noticed that I am probably one of the few YouTubers that love reading and interacting with people. If you've gotten a like from me from any of comment, that means I literally read your comment right then and there at that specific moment. It's not just, and even if I didn't respond to it, you know, I'm still reading every single person's like comment and, you know, review of my review or something like that, you know? Um, recently though, if, you know, if I can pick one, my proudest, video has to be the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 review. And the reason why is because for one, it's literally months after the game came out. So I didn't expect it to be popular at all. And second of all, it was a test to see if I can make a meaningful video in two days, two days. So that's outside of playing the video games. And like I said, playing the video game is not the job. Making the video is. So the fact that I was able to make that video in two days and create what I call an emotional resonance with you as the audience member, right? That's a big deal to me. You know, like the, quest the question of like, what would you do if you have 10 years to live? That's a big philosophical question, right? But if you've also played the game, you know that it's relevant to the game itself. I typically write scripts and dialogue that have double speak to them and so what usually happens is and this is on purpose by the way so what usually happens is when you watch the video again after beating the game you start noticing my double speak and that i had been talking about the plot of the game in front of your face you just didn't know the context to it but with the added context of finishing the game you go back to my video and watch it and you're like I get it now. I see what you're trying to do here. And I think that's kind of really fun. It, it adds more meaning to just a review. Like, yes, reviews are supposed to help people buy games, but that, can, that can't be the only reason why, right? There's opportunities to learn and teach people something or even, you know, do fun stuff like this, like do double speak and be like in the in crowd of people who actually finish the games and be like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I get what you're talking about. And so I think that's, you know, there's so much creativity that goes into these videos that it's really difficult to like even pick one. But yeah, but from a production standpoint, I'm really proud of what I did with Xenoblade Chronicles 3 because guess what? I don't think any of you thought that it only took two days to make that video, but it felt like there's so much thought put into it that it felt like uh, a video that I worked like five to seven days in. That being said, like I have been working on other projects concurrently that are that is taking longer, so I got to be better at that. Got to be better. Okay, so I refreshed the browser. It is 10.59 a.m. here. So I'm gonna cut it off like right there. But before you go, I just wanna say thank you very much for anybody who has posted questions here. And if you're new to the channel and this is the first time you're seeing me or seeing any of my content, I really wanna encourage you to check out all the pieces of content that I have um, in the channel itself. So if you go and click on my channel name, there's a whole bunch of playlists that I personally curated that has everything from the ribbon rank, all the podcasts that I, inter you know, that I did and stuff. Like I interviewed Hironobu Sakaguchi, the father of Final Fantasy, for example. I interviewed a lot of your favorite YouTubers as well, um, but also reviews, previews, impressions of Japanese games, JRPGs, RPGs, niche titles, and indies. Like my goal for the channel has always been about the three words that I mention in my banner, which is discover, play together, discover, because I want you guys to discover new games to play every single time. The world of video games is huge. Why confine yourself in a very small spot? Because, you know, I've definitely discovered a lot by exploring, you know, different genres and stuff. Play, because we love, who doesn't like playing games, right? That's really the most important thing here is indulging in our hobby and loving it again. And of course, the last piece is together because without you guys and without the things that 
we've done to make this channel as approachable and friendly as possible, you know, like we're making a statement. We're basically telling people that video games can be fun again. We can still acknowledge the ills of the industry and the bad stuff that happens, but we need to always bring it back that video games are fun. And that's what I want you guys to come away with in this video. So I want us to reach 100,000. I am almost in my mid 40s. I don't know how long I can take to, I'm, although I, I kid that I'm probably gonna make videos until like I'm in my 70s or 80s and stuff. Let's hope like I can reach that point. But I do hope that you guys enjoyed this video and let me know what you think in the comments as well. Um, this is the first time I've been vlogging for a long time and underneath this, I'm really sweating because this jacket is really good at keeping me warm which is not great because we have the heater on. So I'm gonna go and thank you again for watching this video. And I hope to see you guys next time and in the new videos. All right, bye.